Welcome to Statewide IT, and thanks for coming to our presentation. Uh, we're talking about project management from the ground today. So uh, we're talking about project management from the ground. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. We have, uh, we have some automated tweets going out on a hashtag, PMFTG, as you see right here. Um, one of those tweets is going to have a link to your, some resources that we've used to put this presentation together. Um, JPEGs of our slides, um, some other uh, resources. Um, and that's th the first tweet went out already, so you have, ac excuse me, you have access to those resources at this point. Um, and later on at the end, we'll be taking questions through Twitter if, if you wanted to put um, questions into the, the feed. That would be great, too. We'll keep an eye on that. So what is project management from the ground? Uh, Aaron and I are managers, and we do manage projects, but we are also the people who often have to do the, the work on a daily basis. And so we were, we were thinking about, you know, how, how do you actually manage projects when you have to be doing all those little things? You don't have the time or the resources to step back and be a project manager alone. You don't have the resources to go through all of the single, singular steps of project management as a formalized way of working. So for us, we wanted to just look real closely at our processes, the way we manage our projects, and how they, um, and maybe some tips and tricks that we can share with you guys um, that have been successful for us. So we're both media producers. We'll most likely throw out some jargon at one point or another. If no one, if anyone misunderstands our jargon, please raise a hand and we'll clarify. We've tried not to be too jargony with our media production uh, terms. So um, this project, this uh, presentation is set up for in, in uh, four sections. We're going to getting started um, vision, so creating a vision and going with it, uh, communication and organization. Those being sort of the most important <laughs> aspects that we feel um, tie together all project management. Um, So I'm going to hand it over to Aaron. I'd like to start with a little quote. Um, the great thing in the world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we are moving. I think that really speaks a lot about project management from the ground in that it doesn't matter where we are on the org chart. Uh, as long as we're moving forward, being organized, practicing good communication skills, and always keeping that vision in mind, we can move forward. I think it's very important for anybody to keep in mind, whether you're a director of a department all the way down to a student worker, we can be moving forward. And that's really what project management from the ground is all about. Oliver Wendell Holmes was the man that uh, gave that quote. And in addition to being a 19th century poet, doctor, and professor, he also served as a visual inspiration for Colonel Mustard from the Clue Games. Um, the other usual suspects are myself. Uh, I'm Aaron Pagores, Media Production Manager at IU Northwest, and I'm also currently serving as the Interim Director for Instructional Media Services. And my project management story really came about uh, as an organic process, as I found myself managing more and more complex projects. I found myself turning to the same questions and using the same processes over and over again. So I really was just formalizing that process, um, and I continue to do that to this day just formalize things, document things better, to continue to be an effective project manager. So uh, I'm Joel Langston. I'm the uh, manager of media services on the IU South Bend campus. Um, my project management story is long and twisty. My professional life started uh, in the film business, where I was a lowly electrician and there was no project management to be had. I just did what I was told constantly. Um, then moving up through the film industry, I became the head of a department, and I had to manage projects then. But it was really very regimented. Every single day is, is, begins and ends, and the project basically only happens that day, and then you move on to the next day. Um, so you focus really on the, the moment in, in film. And so 
once I moved into uh, this position and had to manage multiple projects and multiple times with different staffing and different needs, I really had to learn on my own how to handle all this stuff, how to manage it, keep it, keep track of it. For a long time, I tried to keep it in my head. That only worked so well for so long. Um, and so I kind of, like Aaron, I had to come up with my own process of how to do project management. I would steal a little bit from uh, certain management, uh, project management sessions that I had seen, but I, I just knew that I couldn't use it at all. And, and so uh, we, both of us, kind of really got in tight to the things that are most important that, that really make a difference when we're managing our projects. So, Monopoly. So let's get started. So right off the bat, we need to talk about communication, resource management, organizational tools, um, all kinds of different little bits and pieces to project management that are really important that all line up. Um, Hold on, Joel. But before we just dive right in, let's talk about how to get started with a project to manage. What a novel idea. Um, the initial kickoff meeting is very important for any kind of project, whether it's a multimedia project, a uh, campus-wide IT project, or just a small initiative maybe in your office. Um, the kickoff meeting is, is important to organize those resources, or at least identify the resources that you will need to organize throughout the project. And also, that's a good time to practice clear communication, as well as a time to really shape the vision that your project will become. Um, I like to use uh, Pictionary as an example of shaping the vision. When I was taking this photo, the, uh, the student workers in my office were like, what is that on there? I said, well, it's shaping the vision. Um, I resisted the urge to convince them that it was an Illuminati code, but um, they, they didn't really understand what we were talking about. And then I, I um, was explaining, yes, it's, it's shaping the vision, which is important to do for your initial kickoff meeting, because that vision is going to take you through the entire project. Um, that initial kickoff meeting, um, having successful communication and, and understanding the scope of the project early on can really mean the difference between uh, ambiguity and clarity uh, or a good experience versus a bad experience for the overall project. Working in IT at IU, it's not really the difference between a failure and a successful project because I know at least on my campus, we get things done no matter what, but a lot of times it can be at the last moment or it can be a really stressful process if the initial kickoff meeting um, it wasn't really there, or if we didn't quite identify all the pieces of the puzzle early on. So that's all I have really to say about the initial kickoff meeting. I know, Joel, I think you have a little bit more to say about yeah. that. So um, on my campus, in my department, we have a form. We have created a form that's four pages long. Um, we call it the first meeting form. It's a list of probably 47 different questions um, that really detail what the project is, the scope of the meeting, how um, long it's going to take, who are the audience, who are the stakeholders, you know, just sort of getting a real sense of the whole thing. Now, when I usually sit down for this first meeting, there's hardly any chance that I'm going to use all 41 questions or whatever. But the important part is that I formalized a way to really in, in a 30 to 50 minute meeting, get a sense of exactly what I'm being asked to do, exactly the scope of my project, um, and, and who's it for, what's going to happen at the end. Of course, these aren't always perfect. You, there's always going to be a wrinkle. There's always going to be some new um, parameter. Uh, for media, it's often that the person asks for something in the beginning, like, I want a DVD. I want a single DVD of this video. OK, that's fine. No big deal. But then, inevitably, at the end, they want it to go online. And you, know, you have to check and see if we've already got the permissions for the music. And all, you know, all this stuff has to be, ideally, worked out in the, um, the kickoff meeting with my first meeting form. Is the, that's how I do it on my campus. Um, yeah. The next one. Aaron does things a little differently, but it pretty much encompasses the same set of ideas. Yeah, we, um, my, my process is a little bit different. 
but um, really the same thing is there, and that's just really defining that project and shaping the vision early on. And I just ask four questions. I don't have a whole list of things like Joel does. He breaks it out a lot more in depth and detail than I do. But I ask four questions, and then from there, branch it off depending on, on how the initial meeting goes. The first question I ask is who the target audience is for the media project. Um, so a lot of, a lot of times, uh, a dean or a director of a department will come to me and say, I'd like a promotional video for my department. Great. OK. Who's your target audience? I didn't really think about that. OK. Is your target audience a potential donor? Is it uh, a prospective student that is, is considering either coming to the university or coming to you know, your degree program? Who's really your target audience? Once we identify who the video is for, we can identify how to craft the message and, and how to really go about the project. Now, in other fields of IT, because I know most people out there are probably not media production managers or really involved in, in video production very much at all, um, I can break this up into a little bit more broader IT um, terms. And that, that could be maybe um, you get a request in to install a piece of software on um, student lab computers. Okay, who, who's your audience? Who are you actually doing the work for? It would be the students, because be, you're, because you're installing software on computers that primarily students are going to use. That would be, you know, kind of your target target audience for that. And the next question I always ask is, what the core message is. Once we have identified a, a target audience, who you'd really like to speak to, or who the project is for, um, to identify the core message, or really what is the main point of the project, or what are your objectives? And it really should be one main thing for the project. You'll have other messages or other tasks that support your main project vision or goal, but there really should be one core thing that your project sets out to accomplish. Um, in, well, like in video, it could be, say we've identified a prospective student as uh, the core audience. The core message then would be, Look at all the great things that our program can offer, and you know, come, come take a look, check us out. And usually that involves a call to action. Visit our website, call a phone number, and talk to the secretary, something like that. The method of delivery is another important thing I like to ask. And that, again, for video, can be very important, because the way you craft a video for just YouTube or to send out a little email blitz is going to be a lot different than a video you use in a live presentation. In a live presentation, you sort of have your audience's um, attention captivated. They're going to spend a little bit more time watching the video than if you just send it to them in an email. Because the, uh, especially the YouTube analytics show that people tend to only watch about half of the length of the video. There's kind of a bell curve. Very few people watch just a couple seconds, and very few people watch all the way to the very end and they're by themselves watching a YouTube video. But in a live presentation, they're much more likely to watch a longer video um, and watch you know, the whole thing. So the method of delivery is important in, in multimedia, and that can really help to shape how you perform your project and, and really the scope of it. In broader IT sense, um, going back to the software installation example, method of delivery could be, can it just be stream uh, with IU Anywhere? Um, is do you need to bring some physical media, a, uh, a CD to install the program? Can you boot something up with a flash drive? So just thinking about the resources that you have and how you're actually going to perform the work is another thing that should be identified in that first meeting. The final question I ask, which a lot of times I think uh, people overlook, is who are all your key stakeholders? And what I mean by that is who will all be involved in the approval process once the work is done? before you can actually say, this project is finished and checked off the list and approved, I can move on to the next project. Um, that's very important to identify because a lot of times the client or the person that first comes to you about setting up a first project won't be the only stakeholder. So it's important to think of who else will this project impact and maybe they need to be brought in on it early on and maybe they should just be uh, made aware of the project and just have good communication with that person. For example, um, some of the northern regional campuses recently went through a VHS retirement project where uh, the VHS parts are harder and harder to come by, more expensive and more expensive to replace. So we began sending out messages to our campuses saying VHS will be retired you know, at this timeline, this timeline, this timeline. 
and then also the, the measures that faculty members can take in order to make sure that they can still run the effective classroom. Bring your media in to have it backed up, maybe look at buying the new versions of the media, things like that. So we gave them options in order to continue their classroom, as well as letting them know that this is a project that will be going on, and this is what we're going to be doing. So even though it was an IT initiative, obviously a major stakeholder in that project was the faculty members that are using the classrooms. And it was very important for us to recognize that and communicate with them very early on. Yeah. So that's getting started. Um, it's super important, uh, as one of my favorite books is, has a quote, um, a beginning is a very delicate time. That's from Dune, Frank Herbert. Um, so that's you know, kind of the cap to getting started. So next we're moving on to communication. Communication being, in my mind, one of the single most important things to project management. Making sure that everybody is on the same page, everybody understands the same terms. Um, for example, Aaron and I made this picture of the Red Hawk, that's the uh, mascot for Northwest, and the Titan, which is the mascot for South Bend. We had to figure out how to get these pictures taken so that they would come together seamlessly, mostly. Um, so, you know, in our terms, we're talking about camera right and camera left. So the Titan's on camera right, the Red Hawk's on camera left. But if you're the Titan, obviously left and right is different. So that's why we use terms like camera right and camera left. You've got to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Everybody understands the same words, the definitions are the same. Um, for instance, um, Soon, one of the things you really want to worry about is when people want to be um, unclear with their language. Soon should be a red flag. If someone says, I want this project soon, your first question should probably be exactly when. Um, I've run into a number of situations where um, in my former life I had a director who would always say soon when they meant yesterday. And then I've also run into people um, in my current life where soon is uh, a few weeks down the line, I don't really know, and possibly I'll stop caring about it by then anyways. So you really just need to define your terms, make sure everybody involved in the process, not just the project manager and the client, but everybody involved is using the same words and that they actually mean the same thing. Ambiguous terms like soon or big or sometimes that should be completely outside of a project manager's vocabulary to the point where if you, have a, if you have a project meeting or you're speaking with a client that uses an ambiguous term like that, to really stop them and say, what exactly do you mean? Soon? Is that tomorrow? Is that next week? Is that next month? And, and really kind of quantify that, that idea and put a hard date or a hard, um, just make sure everybody is in perfect understanding of what soon or big or you know, something like that means. Oh, yeah. So, um, Joel, I have a game for us to play real quick. Let's, since we're, we're talking about games a little bit on there, at least that's the, the uh, theme of our slideshow, let's do a quick rocks, paper, scissors for who takes the next topic. Ready? So if I win, I take the next topic, or if I lose, I take the next topic? Let's just play, and then I'll tell you. <laughs> that's good. All right, ready? Sure. One, two, three, go. Wait. Wait a um, why did you do that? Because we go on going in Gary. It's well, we go on three oh, in no, South Bend. It's you go on go. Okay, let's try again. All right, you know what? You're just going to take the next topic. Go ahead. <laughs> Dang it. So, obviously, it's important to make sure that you're talking about the same thing. Where I grew up, really, we would go one, two, three, and that's it. That's how we would play Rochambeau. Um, it was actually a little shocking when Aaron and I first started talking about this because I'd never heard of anyone go one, two, three, go. One, two, three, start. One, two, three, whatever. So um, communication, you want to make sure constantly at all times that everybody's talking about the same thing, that um, you never, and you want to constantly be 
uh, checking in to make sure that the, your terms haven't even changed. Because sometimes soon will change. Soon will be a different date today as tomorrow. Hopefully you've nailed that down to a specific date. But um, if not, then at least you can keep up with how your client is thinking or your customer or your boss. As long as you're communicating with them, as long as you're keeping the dialogue open and two ways, hopefully you won't get caught later on in the project not understanding, not having understood what was asked for in the first place. Um, My wife and I are avid uh, tabletop and board gamers, and um, I'm sure many people have had this situation happen to them where maybe a friend brings over a a new game, uh, a card game, a board game, something, and they've played it before, and they really love it. They want to share that their experience with you. They want to share that game with you, but everybody just wants to jump right in. They just want to skip and gloss over the, the directions. So... Joel, who do you think would win in a game where if, if I brought some of my games to my to your house that I've, I've known, I've played, and I'm really good at, I just say, okay, let's open this up and play, and you, know, you just roll the dice and move, and that's how you play. Who do you think would win? Well, if it's in my house, and the house rules, and I always win. But if you're bringing in the game, and I don't know the rules, and you only tell me a few of the rules, then I'm most likely going to still win. I mean, lose. Well, I think as, as IT people, we're definitely experts in our field, and sometimes we can forget that we've played the game before, and we know the rules, but sometimes our clients don't quite speak our language, and they don't quite understand the rules like we do. And it's important not only to understand where your client is coming from, but making sure they know where you're coming from, and to speak, to really share the rules with them and to let them know where you're coming from so everybody can play the game on the same field, especially when you're working together. Um, You're collaborating across disciplines, maybe even across campuses, like Joel and I have, so everybody has a fair chance of playing the game and and getting it done together and getting it done well. Yeah, so communication is super, super duper important, um, even in our process, where we we work at different campuses. They're about an hour drive away from one another, so when we were making this whole presentation, we would meet for, via video, video conference for an hour a week for the past, what, eight weeks or something? Yeah, something like that. But nothing really could compare to sitting down last night for the first time and really going through face-to-face our presentation. It really matters how you see other people, how they see you, um, especially when you're getting into the nitty-gritty of a project. You really need to understand the subtleties of the communication that's coming at you even if it's just body language or, you know, like there's something uncomfortable in the room and you just, you just need to tease out that little detail that is going to bite you in the end. Although sometimes, no matter how much good communication you have, things are going to fall apart. Just like in Jenga. I should have timed that better. Anyway, <laughs> just like in, in Jenga. Uh, things are going to fall apart even if, you have, even if you have great communication. Obstacles will pop up. Things will come completely out of left field. And then what do you do? My, yeah, my, hold on a sec. My team uh, in instructional media, we work very frequently with uh, the marketing department. And we don't just produce videos and multimedia for IT or for education departments. But we, uh, one of our biggest clients is the marketing department on the Northwest campus. And we, we were tasked with crafting an adult degree completion ad this past spring um, targeting uh, adult learners who maybe had taken some semesters of a bachelor's degree and then moved on to do some other things. So we, were, um, we wanted to create, create an ad for them to maybe garner some interest in coming back and finishing their degree. Um, the ad ended up working great at the end, but the process was far from a good experience. We're going to go ahead and play the ad, and then I'll talk to you about some of the challenges that, that happened. We all have to put our goals on hold once in a while. But it's never too late to return to our ambitions, to rekindle that fire, rediscover old challenges, find new rewards, and finish what matters where it matters. Fulfill your goals and complete your degree. Indiana University Northwest. So that was our 30 second spot. Anyway, um, that, was, that was really something that the whole team really came together and, and rallied around. And, and 
spent a lot of time and effort on it, and, and we're really proud of that piece. Um, but it was not without difficulties and challenges. Um, our client was the marketing department. So we, we did our due diligence. We went through the whole um, first initial kickoff meeting, talked about, OK, this is going to be a great ad for the campus. Let's talk about something, how things are better when they're finished. So let's take something that's unfinished and then walk through the process of going back and finishing it. And that's a metaphor for going back to school and actually completing your degree. So um, the, the actual focal point was different in different iterations. We were talking about maybe restoring a car or baking a cake, you know, coming to like this you know, soupy bowl of pudding or whatever is in a cake. And, um, but then actually going through and making it and getting it. Uh, we ended up deciding that the, the unfinished painting was probably the strongest idea. And we went forward with it. Um, so Joel, who do you think might have been a stakeholder besides instructional media services who produced the ad and marketing who came to us for the ad? With um, using the art gallery and everything else, who do you think might have been another stakeholder? So you're using a painting? Yep. In an art gallery? Yep. At a university? Mm-hmm. Did you ask an art professor? We did not ask an art professor, but an art professor found us. <laughs> and um, we ran into an obstacle. We, we did not properly identify um, the art faculty as a stakeholder because we were so invested in the idea, not so much the focal point of that piece of art. We were invested in this idea of transformation and completing a degree that the focal point didn't really matter to us. And it didn't matter to our client, which is marketing. So when I went to um, the faculty members and asked, hey, can we use the spot to, to shoot an IU Northwest ad? I'm like, yeah, sure, what's the spot about? Oh, we're using this painting, and it's going to be really fun, and we won't take up too much of your time or anything. OK, can I see the painting? Yeah, yeah, you can see the painting. Well, that's where we really had an obstacle, because it didn't quite match um, the standards of some of the art faculty. And it also was suggested that we use some student works, which, for whatever reason, we were so invested in the idea of the ad and not the focal point of the ad that we didn't even really think about consulting an art faculty member or using any student work, which is a major mistake, I think, on, on our part. Um, but by then, the, the production schedules had been set. We had a particular budget. And this, this train was moving, so it was either jump off or try to fix it. So we worked very closely with this instructor. And I think a lot of times, if we're moving along on projects and something just comes out of left field like this, like, oh, you can't use the painting that you picked. And no, you can't use our space until you, know, you do it my way. I think sometimes maybe we get upset or angry or say, you know, this person isn't really being reasonable. Or I can't believe they're ruining my project. But I think it's important to know or to keep in mind that I think everybody um, has a different point of view, and they all are trying to do what's best for the university. And that was certainly true in this case. And even though it was, it was a tough pill to swallow, yeah, we made a mistake. It's really late in the game. We already spent some money on some commercial art to use. Um, we really need to work together. And that comes back to looking at the original vision and making sure we stay true to that original vision, but also having good communication and being able to deal with these obstacles. It's like running a race and then a hurdle just pops up, even though it's not a hurdle race. You just got to leap over it, even if you get kind of caught off guard. So that was the first obstacle. Um, yep. We also had, um, we had an actress drop out because it took so long for the painting situation to get resolved. And uh, we had a voiceover for the ad that was saved incorrectly. So as if anything could, you know, Nothing, nothing, nothing went right for this ad. But we finally got it done just because we, we maintained that original vision and we just dealt with it and communicated effectively. So you'd say at the end all of the pieces fell into place? I would say that all the pieces fell into place, yes. Well, that's nice. Eventually. So um, we're IT people. We like our tools, especially when it comes to organization. Um, we're always, I'm always trying to find new, uh, new pieces of software that can help me organize myself better um, because I just won't do it on my own. Um, 
And so I'm going to talk about um, one of the things that I've found that works for me, um, and then we'll, we'll be talking about other uh, tools that we've used um, with more specifics. So the, the piece of software that I use primarily is Asana. Asana is a web-based project management uh, service. It's free. Um, it takes moments to set up. And it works pretty well. Um, I'm not sure I would call it a project management suite so much as a task manager, but it works pretty well for me. Go ahead. Okay. So this is an Asana screen. Um, I've got myself and my tax, tasks over on the left. Um, my team is below me, and then we've got major projects below that. Um, it's got a great way of um, communicating back and forth. You can do comments that are going to be time-stamped, so you know exactly when people are doing the things. Um, there's due dates. You can assign each bit, um, each part to different people. Um, everybody will get email notifications. It's for, for me and my process, it was really a godsend. I was coming into a semester where I was having tons and tons and tons of really small projects that were all piling up on one top of one another. And if it's three or four large projects and they're never going to kind of come to fruition at the same time, I can sort of manage to keep that in my head if I had to. But when it comes to 20 different projects and they're all happening at the same time and I only have three people that work for me and myself and uh, we only have two cameras and you really have to kind of keep track of this stuff and you have to make sure that the people who are working for you and with you can keep track of it too. So for us, Asana has been working really well. I am looking forward to um, the team box uh, presentation that's tomorrow. No, actually, it's today at 4 in the Frangipani room, in case anybody is interested. Um, a couple of the weaknesses to Asana are, A, they don't have a Gantt chart system, so you can't really see visually how all of your projects are coming together and maybe all the resources. And being a very visual person, it's, that would be really great to have. Um, but just as a free product, you take what you can get. Um, the other thing, uh, well, along with the Gantt chart, it doesn't really have very much as far as resource management. So I can put my people in there, but I can't manage equipment or just time slots or rooms. And that's something that would be very valuable to me. Um, and I really can't chunk them out. I still have to go back into my calendaring, calendaring system to really get a sense of who's working when, or when we're doing a shoot, and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Speaking of calendaring. There you go. So to me, calendaring is very, very important. Um, I often forget what I'm going to do now, tomorrow. Um, if I didn't have my calendar reminding me, I probably wouldn't even be here. Um, so this is an example, well, this is a couple weeks ago um, in my life. And in orange, I've got the, my part-time workers. That's when they're all in my office, ready to go. And then the purple is just what I've got to do. Different um, shoots, different meetings. Sometimes, um, I don't know if you can read this, but right here it says social media R&D. That's a meeting with myself to do research and development for social media. So I'll, I know that's the time when I'm going to sit down and get on Twitter and do whatever, or Facebook, or whatever little thing I need to do to forward my knowledge of social media and how I use it as an effective tool. Um, that really helps me when I schedule my time, because we also have um, my office also uh, serves as kind of a media help desk. So we have faculty, staff, and students coming into my office all the time, asking questions about how to rip a DVD, how to uh, export a file as a different file type, whatever. So my day is constantly interrupted by these, uh, these interactions. Now, of course, it's part of what we do, and I love the, that interaction. But if it comes you know, every 10 minutes for three hours, then I can't get anything done. So I will schedule these meetings with myself, close my door, and that's, that's just sort of my time to finish that task. That, that, um, Um, sure. There's really no one right way to do things. And what works for Joel, um, 
I, I do things a little bit differently, and I'll do a little, I'll do things a little bit differently than any anybody out here. So I think what's important to keep in mind is just take away from this what you will, and just just make your project management style work for your workflow, your department, and for however you best operate. For me, um, I use my I use my phone for everything. Right now, it's timing how long I have left to talk up here, but. Um, I have, you know, my cat, my Outlook is tied into my is in, tied into my phone. I have my alerts in there, and then I also use uh, Excel spreadsheets to handle really complex projects. Um, I mentioned earlier at the beginning that um, my project management style sort of evolved from taking on increasingly complex projects, and this is just about as complex as they come. We're right now undergoing um, about a two-year timeline project, developing a degree video for every major offered at the IU Northwest campus. Uh, and it's really just a short, very brief informational video about what a student might learn about and what kind of career options they may have once they attain this degree. So it's a really, really large project. And even though all the different videos don't have a lot to do with one another, we wanted to sort of manage our resources from early on. So we're not redesigning a new video every single time we're shooting another uh, degree uh, degree video. So we have the actual name of the degree and the name of the video over here. Um, this is the status, whether it's in pre-production, that's like the scripting period, whether it's finished, whether we're editing, shooting, uh, the deadlines. And then this is where we're managing some of our, our, our resources. Um, the graphic package to make sure that we're not using too many different styles, but we're also not using the same one over and over and over again because we don't want it to look stale, but we also don't want it to just be all over the place. Uh, same thing with the music. This is actually the editor in charge of the project. There's two media production managers on my campus. It's me um, and a colleague of mine, Tomei. Um, the shoot location, again, just to make sure it doesn't look stale so we're not always shooting in the same student lobby. Um, what else do we have? And the final location, this is just for us to know where that video will reside once it's finished. So this is how I keep track of everything. And it's a document that we update at least once a week. And we work off of this document uh, in our biweekly meetings with the marketing department because they're a partner in that. Um, it was sort of a, a, a project that, ooh, it was sort of a project that grew out of meetings between between marketing and IT, and we, we came up with the idea together. But it was, a, it was a very large project to manage, and that's how I how I manage that project. And again, I, would, I can't stress enough, everybody's going to do it this differently. I look at this, and it kind of gives me a bit of a headache, because what I really want to see is, I, like that Gantt chart, where I can really see visually how everything connects together. I mean, it could almost be like a brain map or something. That would work for me, where it's it just doesn't it doesn't jive for me. So everybody's going to have to come up with their own best practices. But I think the important thing is that you do that. You actually make the effort to create some sort of best practice for yourself. Um, and you'll thank yourself later when you've actually planned ahead a little more than you had previously. Um. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about resource management, which falls into the organization category of project management. Um, we said earlier on that project management from the ground really involves uh, organization, communication, and vision. And organization is a big part of that. We talked about some of the, the ways that we organize um, the general resources. Now we're going to get into the types of resources that we'll manage. Um, in the game of life, there's a lot of different cards, lots of different things that you're grabbing from. And having it well organized like this is a lot easier than digging through the box to find the right card when it's time to get a career. So I'd like to use actually today's presentation as an example of resources that we had to manage. Uh, as we mentioned, I'm from the Northwest Campus in Gary. Joel's from the South Bend Campus. And we knew that we had resources that together we had to manage. Even though we don't see each other on a regular basis, we had to identify the types of resources that we would need for this presentation and also just find out what it is that we're going to need for the presentation what, and what it is we need to manage. The first part was our own time management and uh, managing the labor. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we scheduled hour-long uh, video conferencing sessions with each other. 
that wasn't always successful. Sometimes I would have a video that would plop in my lap that I could not get away from um, that would make that hard to, you know, it was impossible for me to attend. Um, same thing with Aaron. He had a couple of times where he couldn't make it. I mean, it's, it's super important to make sure that you, you know when you've got your people, when you've got your, in our, in our world, your cameras, your equipment, whatever resources you need to get it done. Um, you just need to know about all that ahead of time in your own, in your own world. Even, that could even be your own resources, you as the resource. Like, are you going to have enough time and energy to get this task completed in the appropriate amount of time? Okay, do you have a part-timer who can help? Or, or is there another manager who can give you some resources? I mean, it's really important to make sure that when you actually get started, you have the ability to get started, to keep going, to um, maneuver through all the things, all the issues that, that you're going to run into. So in addition to... The, the time or the labor resource, you have your physical resources. We had to make sure that we had um, not just a laptop, but also the connection. Joel brought a Mac, so we had to make sure that we had uh, a Mac video connection as well as audio. Um, we knew we were taking photographs. We had to make sure that we had camera available to take the, to take the photographs. And then other just physical resources like that. We had to make sure it were available and we could use throughout the project, not just today. Another important resource is the intangible resources, your digital resources, the actual digital photographs that we're using, the PowerPoint slide, the Twitter feed. These are all important resources for our presentation, but they're, they're the intangible digital resources that we had to still keep, keep stock of and manage. So time management is going to be a huge part of this. In the way that I like to work with my clients is I like to start always my discussions with them at the end. Where are we going to get to at the end? When is this going to show? When I, I sometimes call it the drop dead date. When can we not tweak this anymore? It absolutely has to be playing now. <clears throat> so, time, you know, managing that time, making sure that you have um, time, uh, milestones that you can actually keep. So I, I'll end up starting at the end. This is when this video is going to show. And then I try to give myself a week from that time, going back in time. So that's when the approvals will happen. That's when my client will say, yes, it's good to go. Or, hey, I need to tweak this some or whatever. If I've got that week, great. I have time to make those changes. And then I'll go back another week and say, OK, this is when I think I'm done. <laughs> The editing is finished. We think we're good. Let's sit on it for a couple days, make sure we think it's fine, then show it to the client, that kind of thing. You really got to make sure that you have that buffer to make changes if you need to. And in the very beginning, you, you, if you can, you want to try to get an agreement with your client that if that final due date changes, moves this way, everything else has to move that way too. We just um, we have a new chancellor on our campus, and we've done a couple videos for him. And um, he asked for one about a, two weeks after he came on campus to show all of our new faculty in a video. Well, of course, not all of our faculty were even on campus at that point. It was this was like early August. They weren't required to be, you know, ready to go until late August. So it was a really hard time getting all that lined up. We had a hard deadline. We had this all-campus meeting where he wanted to play this video. And I said, OK, well, then we need to start shooting tomorrow. Of course, that didn't happen. The, the project didn't come out the way we really hoped. That was an organizational issue that we didn't have any control over. But still, we, we managed to get it done within the parameters that we set for ourselves. And when knowing that the, the Knowing that final deadline, we really got a sense of when all of our milestones were going to be. And we stuck to them because we had to. We absolutely had to. Otherwise, the project would just not come off. And the client had to be flexible at least up to a point with those milestones so that we could actually get everything we needed to done. So once we have reached our, our deadline and the project is at the end of its course, um, we go through an approval stage, and that's when we kind of circle back to 
uh, those four questions I asked at the beginning of the presentation, which uh, the most important one at the end is to identify those stakeholders. Because now the work is done, more or less, and you need to bring it forward for the approval stage and show it to these people that are stakeholders and have approval rights <coughs> for the project. Uh, and then also just kind of revisiting and seeing what the original vision was at the beginning of the project and see how far how far off you were at the end or if you were right on target or, or how that veered. And you can also take that time to sort of assess how the project went, see if there were any obstacles that could have been avoided, see if there were some obstacles or, or some processes that maybe you could handle differently or improve upon the next time a similar project comes up. I want to give a quick... Uh, Hooray to Box. So everybody hopefully knows that we have the system called Box, box.iu.edu. Um, it's my favorite toy for getting approvals for my work. Because what I can do is I can throw my video into Box and then send a link to my client, and then I'll get a notice when they look at it, which is a really big deal for what I do. Because a lot of times I'll send a video to someone, it'll be on DVD, it'll get stuck in their desk or a drawer or whatever, and they won't look at it for a week, and I'll have to call them and remind them, hey, you know, I need you to give me approvals. But in Box, I can get a notice, I can set really high not notifications for that folder, so every time anyone even thinks about clicking on a link, I get, a, I get an email. Oh, the chancellor looked at that video. Now I can email them back and say, oh, well, how did you like it? Um, that's a really powerful tool for me, uh, just to be able to see what action is taking place within the sections that, I, that I'm working in. So what happens, yes, what happens if you get pulled into a project and you're not the project manager? Maybe you get pulled on to a job at, in the final stages of a project, or you're part of a bigger team, and you're just not the project manager. That's not your role for the project. Does any of this stuff still apply? Absolutely. I, to me, I think that you're a project, you're a manager of a project, no matter what you're doing. Even if you're just a tiny little cog in a big machine, you still have to manage your time. You still have to manage your resources. You still have to communicate to your supervisor, your boss, your client, whether or not you can complete the task that was given to you, or whether or not you need more resources or more time or whatever. But as long as you're managing yourself, you really get a, uh, you can really control, to some degree anyways, how the rest of the project is moving with you in it as this organic beast that trundles forward or doesn't, depending. And understanding the project as a whole. Uh, it just it really involves asking a lot of questions, again, practicing good communication skills, having good organization, even if it's only yourself and your own resources you're organizing and understanding the vision of the project and, and what the true goal is. That way you can better understand your role, even if it's not clearly defined for you. And with that, we have come to the end. Um, if we've, we have Twitter going. Um, I haven't seen any questions yet at hashtag PMFTG, project management from the ground. Um, but feel free to ask us any questions you'd like. Please remember, we are not experts on project management. We aren't experts on what we do and our process. And we just, I mean, at the end of the day, we really wanted to share just some ideas that we had come up with when we were really focusing on how our process worked or how it didn't work or when it broke down. Um, so any questions or comments? We did get comments on Twitter. Thank you. Kate Messing, Charles McLaren and Heather Warnsman. Yeah. No. No, no, no. Feel free. You can, uh, you can shout out a question. And... <laughs> what question do you have? We can do that. share that back with the community? Do you use Confluence? Do you use uh, Box? 
Box is great for that, just because you get the receipt. You know when people preview your files. You know when they download the files. You get a message right into your inbox. And you can also set who gets to view it, whether they need to log in with CAS in order to identify things. So it works well with some sensitive information as well. And, um, but not so, yeah, sensitive remember. information. Well, not, not the, not like student social security numbers right, and things right. like that. Not super sensitive something. information. But if, you know, if it's an important project and you don't want it out there for all the internet to see, um, Box is pretty good. Yeah. I, I, uh, Asana. The, the thing with Asana, another kind of um, weakness to Asana is in the free version, um, you, can, you can have this project space, but whoever you've invited to it can do pretty much what they want. It's a little like the Wild West. So I could have one of my part-timers in there, and they could delete something by accident. If you upgrade to the paid version of Asana, you get the ability to really lock it down and set different levels of who can do what. But really, we can communicate back and forth with each other. I can even send a link in Asana to my client so they can see behind the scenes exactly how their project is moving. Now, because we're, we're in Asana, we're using our lingo and our process, they may not understand, but at least they'll get updates on something is happening, and that we're talking about the project, and we're doing this and that and the other. And that can be really valuable at times, just to keep them up to date on it. I use Box as well for that kind of thing. I even, just today, I got a notice that um, Paul Sharp, who's our new executive director interim on our campus, downloaded a video that I had put up. And I was like, oh, Paul Sharp downloaded that. That's great. So it's really nice to get that sense of how things are going, or even communicate in a, in a blind way, in a, to, to a sense, just to make sure that it keeps flowing. You, you know what's going on. They know what's going on. It's, to me, it's super duper important, um, that, that flow of communication. As far as managing multiple projects, and um, especially at, you know, with overlapping timelines and things, the best thing to do, really, is to break up a big project or a multifaceted project into as many small parts, small manageable parts as possible. So you can check them off your list. We have any other questions? You want to check Twitter? Any I other questions? I will check Twitter. Task charge. They want your Excel. Um, no, okay. Actually, I think that, that should be in the resources folder. Our entire presentation is in our, is in our resources folder in Box, uh, as well as our contact information, um, the link to uh, the campus YouTube, where the ad, as well as a number of other videos can be seen. And we have some other goodies in there, too. Yeah, and there's, um, sorry. there's links for our resources folder to the Box folder in our Twitter feed. And it's already come up a couple times. It'll come up again in a few minutes. If, you, if you're not a Twitter, a tweeter, a Twitter person, Twitterizer. Um, you can just track down uh, Joel or I, and we can get you those resources as well. Um, Paul? Would you put that uh, hashtag back up there? Sure. It's, uh, it's hashtag PMFTG. stands for Project Management from the Ground. There you we're, go. we're also um, hashtagging statewide IT. Go for it. How do you manage what? Scope create. I got it. Um, Can no. You repeat the question for the. Oh, right, for the stream. Um, are we, do we bill for our services? And if so, how do we avoid scope creep? Luckily for us, we don't bill for anything. Sorry. However, that doesn't mean we don't have to deal with scope creep. Um, I always say that our. Um, our currency in my job is that you're nice to us. You know, if you come into my office and you ask nicely for something, we're most likely going to give it to you if we can. You know, if we have the resources and stuff. But um, we always try to, in my office, we try to manage expectations right off the bat um, and get a very clear idea of what um, what the project is. Of course, that doesn't mean that there won't be scope creep, but because I have worked with the people around me and on these same projects again and again and again, I, I, I usually get a sense of where there will be scope creep. At least I can identify where it could get crazy. 
um, and stand right there with my catcher's mitt, like ready for it to come that way. Um, it's super hard, especially with um, when you have people who are way, way, way senior to you, and I don't mean in age, um, who are asking you to do a project and then they want a little shift and stuff. Yeah, I, it's super hard, and I don't have a really good answer for that other than we just try to keep, frankly, I will imagine the worst case scenario almost all the time. That's a bummer at, at times, but it, it keeps me sane in the sense that I'm aware of the bad things that could be happening. That's how good, I deal with it. You can also have a good uh, initial document to go back to and say, look, this is, this is what we agreed upon. This yeah. is the scope of this project. We could break it off and do more projects or expand on this project later. Right. Um, but this, this is what the project entails at this, at this point. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Oh, we don't have a choice. Oh, fair that, yeah, that's how the regionals work. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, I think every once in a while there's a discussion about it, but at our level we don't, we're not part of that discussion. Um, uh, and I think it's just a slippery slope for certain areas. But we, yeah, we don't have any choice about that at all. Okay. Any any final questions before before we wrap up? Was what are some strategies managing when different stakeholders have different visions? Oh, oh yeah, that's a good question. Nice. That's a very good question. All right, let me read this out loud. All right, uh, Jenny asks on Twitter, what are some strategies managing when different stakeholders have different visions? <laughs> and that can be really tricky. But I think, I think a good way to manage that is to get everybody in the same room together. Um, you could have, you know, a lot of times you get pulled in a lot of different directions because, like Joel said, we don't bill for our services and um, kindness is a currency. So a lot of times a lot of people are like, oh, why don't you do this for this? Why don't you do this for us? And we don't like to tell people no. We like to get things done. But at the same time, we have to manage the expectations and make sure that we have a project that has a clear ending and a, a clear goal. And when there are multiple stakeholders, it's just, it, it comes down to good communication and shaping that vision. And sometimes you have to do that together. Not sending an email, not, sometimes not even picking up the phone, but actually getting people together in a room for a project meeting and just hashing out all the details so everybody clearly understands the scope of the project. The other thing, too, that I tend to rely on quite a bit is the client is the boss. You may be a stakeholder, you may have an interest in this, but you didn't ask me to do this. The client has come to me and asked for a specific project, a piece of media, whatever, and while you have concerns, you other stakeholders over here, I still have a job to do. I'm still making this thing for my client. We will try to take into consideration your concerns but at some point, it's still the client. It's still, they're still my boss on this particular project. The chancellor is still my boss on this project. It doesn't matter if the math professors think that it's absolutely crazy what we're doing or whatever. VHS was one of those projects where the stakeholders were so widely um, spread out, it was so hard to kind of get everyone understanding. Like, VHS is going away, people. Do, you got a deal because you're history library of 10,000 VHS tapes is not going to last, nor will we be able to play. And it just took a long time for us to really get that home to every single possible stakeholder. Just, sometimes you have to focus on your client. I think that's about time for us. So if you have any further questions or think of something later or would like to talk to us about anything, feel free to uh, check out our resources, contact us directly by email, or um, just to shoot out a tweet, and uh, we'll get back to you. Thank, Thank you very you. much.